Welcome back to Weeknight Mysteries Podcast. My name is Juras, and as every week, I'm joined with uh, my co-host, Rain. How are you today? As always, Rain's here, and I'm feeling good. Feeling okay? How are you? Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling good. Today, we're, we're going to be discussing uh, a case that I had known for a while, and I was always intrigued about it. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Taconic state parkway crash accident in 2009 what happened here so it's essentially a traffic collision that occurred on sunday in july 26th of 2009 on the taconic state parkway in the state of new york eight people were killed when a minivan being driven by a 36 year old Diane Schuler traveled for 1.7 miles in the wrong direction on the parkway and collided head-on with another SUV coming from the opposite side. Diane, as well as her daughter and three nieces, as well as the three passengers in the oncoming SUV were all killed. Diane's five-year-old son, Brian, was the only survivor of the accident. We have some images of the accident that had occurred. Um, We also looked at a documentary in preparation to this podcast called There's Something Wrong with Aunt Diane. Remember, we watched this a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is your takeaway from the documentary? Uh, Well, it seems like that documentary was leaning one way. And I, I'm very much open to hear if there are any other theories. That was a good documentary, by the way, and it seemed like the car was going way too fast. Is that correct? The car was, I think the problem was that it was driving in the opposite lane. Yeah, but it wasn't going too fast? It was going fast, and on top of that, it was going in the opposite lane. Mm-hmm. So two bad things, I'd, I'd say, are happening there. Toxology tests were conducted on um, Diane's body. And uh, it was realized that she was heavily intoxicated with both alcohol and marijuana at the time of the crash. Her husband, Daniel Schuler, had uh, been consistently denying that her, his wife, Diane, was using drugs and alcohol extensively and called for further investigation into other possible medical causes for her erratic driving that led to the death of eight people, including herself. Mm-hmm. Wait, how, just for the audiences, uh, to clear up, to paint a clearer picture, how young were the passengers or how old were the passengers? So Diane herself was 36 uh, years of age. She was traveling with, I believe, a two-year-old daughter of mm-hmm. hers named Erin, her five-year-old son named Brian, and her three nieces who were between the ages of five and nine, I believe. And uh, the people that were driving in the SUV that was coming from the other side, well, essentially the people who were driving on the correct lane Mm -hmm. uh they were i believe uh, one man was 81 we're gonna jump to him uh, Mm -hmm. to the to the victims of that crash as well uh his son was i believe 49 and the family friend who was 74 uh so that's for i guess the reference of uh the age yeah so these were like regular people not like uh, party goers or let's say junkies or whatsoever, right? No, these were really good people. It seems like uh, the people who were caught up on the other side uh, of this accident were actually just traveling to a family dinner, mm-hmm. which was something very normal, very, yeah. very, you know, very unfortunate that they got caught up in this as well. Um, shall we jump to the background of the case and uh, try to dissect this? Because believe it or not, there are lines of thinking here that we could explore. Mm -hmm. At first, and especially after watching that documentary, I kind of only had two theories in my head. 
either this was a medical accident, uh, either that Diane had something medically happening to her on the spot, or she was uh, intoxicated mm -hmm. and high on weed and crashed the car. So there's generally speaking only two theories, but there's some more angles that we could discuss. And there's some details in this case that actually were not shown on that documentary. And I don't think you know about them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to also introduce you as well as the audience at the same time. So I think we could jump to the background of the case. Diane herself, she was a director of billing and collections at Cablevision. It's a big cable television company in America. They are no longer a company. I think they got acquired or something like that. Mm -hmm. but her job was pretty good. I, I've seen, I think on the documentary, they said that she was making $100,000 per year. So that's a pretty good paying job. Yeah, pretty um, good. Then her husband, Daniel, mm -hmm worked uh, nights as a security officer for the parks department. I think it was some sort of a police department where legally he was not required to report his wife's uh, illegal drug use mm -hmm. if it ever happened. So he wasn't, I think, a, a police officer. He was doing some sort of security work. Maybe he was a police officer. I don't really know how that works. But that's his background. The couple didn't see a lot of each other during the week. And Diane was the one who took care of the kids. Aaron, On top of her job? Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. The kids, the house, and everything in between. Daniel's mother jokingly referred to Daniel as Diane's third son or third child. Mm -hmm. Let's say third child. Yeah. Yeah. As if Diane was also taking care of her husband at the same time. I mean, that's just amazing. The amount of um, balance that she has to do every time. Yeah. And, you know. The it's way, not just one kid. Yeah. The way she died, the way she passed away, it makes you question with how can a uh, alleged alcoholic and drug addict be in, on top of everything in their life? Mm -hmm. Pretty strange. Really strange. Diane's brother, Warren Hans whose daughters were murdered. Well, I'd say murders. I, I want to say maybe Involved killed. Involved in the accident? Well, they're dead, so killed in the accident. And his wife, Jackie, let their three daughters go on a camping trip with Aunt Diane and her uh, two children and Daniel. Because these three girls went on the same camping trip last year and they told their parents that they had a good time. Mm -hmm. So Warren Hens and Jackie, the parents of the other three girls who were murdered, they allowed them to go. Yeah. Because it was just supposed to be another family outing, nothing more than that. I mean, by the smile on the children's faces, it really did look like they had a good time and there was nothing wrong. Exactly. And we have a picture from that trip. Mm -hmm. I believe that this picture that we're showing right now is from the trip. This is maybe like a day before the accident. Yeah. Pretty crazy to look at this image. Pretty chilling, yeah. Diana and Warren's dad was supposed to make the trip with them, but he ended up with other plans. He didn't go. This was the grandfather, right? Yeah, the grandfather. Okay. Daniel Diane's husband went up to the campground early so he could set everything up. Diane, along with their daughter Erin and son Brian, picked up the three hens girls, you know, the three nieces of mm -hmm. Diane, and headed up to Hunter Lake in the hens' family minivan. Mm -hmm. So Diane, uh, how should I put it? Borrowed. Borrowed her brother's minivan for the trip because mm -hmm. i don't think she had a car that could fit all the children yeah that's what i'm assuming so they had their i guess weekend fun at the campground nothing strange was reported as far as i was able to locate and then on the day when they left which was sunday at 9 30 a.m the Yan schuler left the hunter lake campground once again she was driving the red 2003 ford windstar minivan borrowed from her brother 
and she collected all the kids mm-hmm. because her husband, Daniel Schuler, who was also on the trip, he left the campground at the same time, but in his pickup truck, and he took the family dog with him. So immediately, since we already know what is going to happen next in this case, do you think that at this point, Diane is actually hungover? From what? I don't know, from potentially drinking alcohol and smoking weed. In the camp crowd? Yeah. With the kids? Yeah. No, I don't think so. It seems to me like it, this was just a, you know, family-friendly, child-friendly camping trip. All right. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure about that anymore. Mm-hmm. Because initially on the documentary, it wasn't reported. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that the Yan was actually a regular weed smoker. Mm-hmm. And she was drinking alcohol on the camping trip. On the camping trip? Yeah. Interesting. I think the father, I think uh, Daniel Schuler first uh, told everyone that she wasn't. Mm-hmm drinking but then he kind of had to backtrack and admit that Leanne was in fact consuming alcohol on the trip that is interesting because i at first impression i thought it was just a family friendly child friendly trip they were just there to take care of the kids or while the kids play and just hang out hang out together Mm -hmm. like chill out together yeah also makes me wonder were there any friction between Daniel and uh, Diane during the camping trip? Because they will proceed to make their way home from the campground, but they are, but it seems like they're driving on two different timelines co- completely. Because mm-hmm. Diane is also making pit stops to McDonald's, etc., and it looks like Daniel is not following along with them daniel is just heading back home with the family dog so maybe this is completely normal maybe i'm just trying to look into things too much here but to me personally this one detail kind of stuck out Mm -hmm. and even i believe uh the families of the victims on the other suv that was also affected by diane's crash claim that they suspect that maybe there had been a fight between Diane and Daniel that day or the day prior. Maybe she was in a bad mood already. Uh, yeah, personally, I wouldn't drive separately. Uh, I would just drive like maybe like a convoy. One is in front or the back driving. So this this is very interesting, yeah. Yeah, on top of that, I have to ask, do you think there could be a chance that Diane, at this point, leaving early in the morning, was she potentially suicidal? Oh, I don't know much information yet to make that um, to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, actually, me too. This is just wild speculation. Wild questions. On the way back to their home in West Babylon, which is in Long Island, in New York, Diane made a few stops. Hmm. The first stop was at 9.56 a.m. in the morning, so around 30 minutes after she had left the campground. She stopped at a McDonald's in Liberty. Liberty is a small town that's kind of adjacent to that campground. Video from security cameras showed that the children were eating and then playing inside of the play area, and Diane may have ordered an orange juice for herself. The cashier would later say that Diane was behaving normally and she seemed sober at that point. They left the McDonald's at 10.33 a.m. So they spent a little over 30 minutes in McDonald's. At 10.46 a.m., which is 15 minutes later, Diane stopped at the gas station. She went inside and apparently asked for pain pills which they didn't have, so she went back to the minivan. The video of Diane from the gas station doesn't show any obvious signs of intoxication. You've seen that video. Mm -hmm. She seems like she's just walking normally here. Yeah, like a regular person, sober person. Yeah, she didn't seem super drunk to me or intoxicated to the point where she would be driving the opposite lane. Oh yeah, no, no, no. She was walking straight and it seemed like she had a purpose look like a regular trip at the store actually 
do you think that when Dian got orange juice mm-hmm. from McDonald's, do you think she was mixing it with vodka that she did have in her car? That's a very good question because it goes together. Yeah, it definitely goes together. So that's, you know, my kind of thought here that... I mean, did she drink it in a car or did she drink it in McDonald's? Well, in McDonald's, she seemed very sober Mm -hmm. still. So I'm thinking maybe she got the orange juice to potentially mix it up with the vodka. Yeah, but then she went to the store and she still seemed completely sober. Exactly. So maybe she started drinking after she left the gas station. Because it's still a couple of hours of driving left. Mm -hmm. Still a bit of a drive. But why though? Well, there's a line of thinking that Diane was actually a secret alcoholic that Mm -hmm. no one knew about. So she was drinking all the time. Wouldn't uh, someone else notice it? Not only the family? Well, maybe they did, but they didn't come forward with that (sighs) to preserve her image. Mm -hmm. At... 11.37 11.37 a.m., so this is around a half an hour after they had already left the gas station, Emma Hens, nine years of age, she was the oldest of the five children. She called her dad, Diane's brother, Warren, from Diane's phone and told him that he might be late. Warren then spoke with Diane, who confirmed that they may be late and at that time, Diane sounded perfectly normal to Warren. So Mm -hmm. 30 minutes after leaving the gas station, she is still sounding normal. Mm -hmm. Between 11.30 a.m. and 12 p.m., witnesses saw the red minivan being driven aggressively on Route 17 in Orange County. One witness said that they saw Diane pulled over on Route 17 at 11.45 a.m. and she was bent over as if she was vomiting. That same witness said a few minutes later, the same red minivan passed them on the highway and was swerving in and out of traffic. Okay, one second. By Between 11.30 to 12, um, some witnesses already saw the minivan driving aggressively. And pulled over and Diane appeared to be vomiting. Yeah, and then somewhere between these times as well, the daughter called the dad. Yeah, that's pretty strange. So this would mean that Emma Hens, to the timeline, according to the timeline that I have, Mm -hmm. called her father at 11.37 a.m. from Deanne's phone. Mm -hmm. And within minutes afterwards, after the call ended, Deanne was seen vomiting Yeah, it's pretty strange. Yeah. Because you would imagine if she was already drunk, drunk driving, her words were slur. Because, you know, when you're drunk, your words slur first. I, I, do, I do see something here. Like, mm-hmm. sorry for cutting you off. No worries. What I want to point out here is that, is there a chance that Diane realized that this is going to be a long drive because, you know, you, we have to make ourselves way back into Long Island. Mm-hmm. There's traffic. Do you think that she realized that this is going to be a long trip? And right after the call ended with Warren, she started drinking because she knew that this was going to be a long ride and it's going to be really boring with five kids in the back. No, I don't think so. If she was just drinking for the sake of drinking, for the sake of entertainment, I don't know, to entertain herself, I don't I don't think she would do that. That's very irresponsible. And by the pictures and by the documentary, she seemed like a very responsible, if not a person, a mom. Her yeah. two-year-old kid was there. Fair enough. Fair enough. She was reported to be a very good mother. Mm-hmm. She was, at well, at, at, for all we know, she yeah. was a good mother. Yeah, and her kids gr- are growing up well, or grew up well. And we see it in the pictures. Uh, but but at the same time, she do- she was reported to have some, uh, I wouldn't say anger management problems, but being very like 
controlling. Hard, controlling and hard on people. Mm -hmm. And she had lived through trauma yeah. in her childhood when her mother abandoned them at a very early age. So I think she was a controlling person mm -hmm. to some extent. I mean, there's nothing bad with being a controlling person if it's not harming anyone. Yeah. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing here. But I wouldn't necessarily go all out believing the documentary immediately because mm -hmm. that's just one source and I've digged around online and there's a lot of other sources that claim that Diane was most likely not as she was portrayed on the documentary. I'm mm -hmm. just saying, I'm not saying anything too bad, but I'm just saying. Yeah, no, no, it's completely okay. I was just referring to the pictures, the pictures of the oh, children. Yeah. The they look very happy. They look carefree, just like how regular kids should be. Yeah, no, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that they mm -hmm. were that they were having a bad time like at this point. No, mm -hmm. no, no. You're right. You're correct in that way. So, Jackie Hens, the mother of the three girls that were killed, mm -hmm. called Diane herself at 12:08 p.m. So around. 10 to 15 minutes after she was seen vomiting on the side road to ask how her many how many tickets she would need for Emma's the oldest daughter's upcoming school show i think it was a school project so they were just talking about the details they spoke for about 2 minutes and Jackie said that everything seemed to be fine at that point between 12:15 p.m. And 12.45 p.m., so 30 minutes into the timeline, we progress. Witnesses saw the minivan pulled over and Diane again appeared to be vomiting outside of the car for the second time. Mm -hmm. Others saw the van swerving, honking the horn for an unusual amount of time and driving aggressively. Did they have any planes that day? I have no idea. Because I was thinking maybe if alcohol wasn't involved, maybe they were just rushing to get back home. To for, I don't know, maybe another appointment somewhere. Maybe they had planes. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. but, but we don't have that information. This was not, this is a good point, mm -hmm. but it just was not mentioned anywhere in the research. Mm hmm. At 12.55 p.m., a wrong number was dialed from Diane's phone. So someone used her phone, most likely Diane herself, mm -hmm. and dialed an incorrect phone number. The call lasted 17 minutes, sorry, 17 seconds. Three minutes later, Diane called Jackie again, and she sounded out of it. So she herself initiated the phone call, which mm -hmm. is interesting to me. They were on the call for about two and a half minutes. When the call dropped, or Diane ended the call herself, it was a weird call. For some reason, Diane picked up the phone and called Jackie, mm -hmm. and she seemed out of it on the call for two and a half minutes, and then she most likely hanged over, hung over the phone. Really strange, right? Mm -hmm. So. At 1.01 p.m., just minutes after this strange call, Warren, Diane's brother and the father of the three girls that were traveling in the Diane that, oh, sorry, in the van, not in the Diane, <laughs> in the van that Diane was driving, called his sister Diane back, right? And they spoke for around eight minutes. While on the phone with Warren, Diane went through the Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, which they assume she went through that bridge at around 1.02 p.m. Although Warren, the brother, has never shared everything that was said on that call, he did say that Diane seemed disoriented. It's been said that Diane even called Warren by her husband's name on that phone call that lasted 8 minutes. That yeah, sounds wrong to me. So she was referring to Warren as Daniel. Mm-hmm. So at this point, that means that she doesn't even understand who she's talking with. Yeah. And she's driving. That's a very bad sign. Yeah, it seems um, seems to me like there was already a presence of alcohol. Mainly because if it was, like, let's say, I don't know, she's, she was having a stroke. 
she would still remember her husband's name. That's a good point. And actually. the brother's yeah, name. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I didn't really think about that one. So Diane pulled the car over at some point after that call, and her niece Emma spoke to Warren. She sounded upset, but told her dad that she was okay, and that there was something wrong with Aunt Diane. He heard the kids crying in the background. Warren then spoke to Diane, and she allegedly told him that she was disoriented and couldn't see properly. And Warren told her to not do anything, stay pulled over, and that he was gonna come and get them, mm-hmm. which is very rational. A few minutes later, at 10... Sorry, at 1 p.m. and 10 minutes, four wrong numbers were dialed back to back from Diane's phone. Somewhere between 10, uh, 1, 10 p.m. and 1, 15 p.m., Diane phone, Diane's phone was left on the concrete guardrail just past the toll booth and Diane drove off. No, I have a question for you. Yeah. The four wrongly dialed numbers. Do you think it was Diane dialing them or the kids? I'm pretty... I actually thought about this Mm -hmm. and I think it was Diane. Really? I think it was Diane. I think it was Diane. Diane was probably trying to get a hold of someone. Mm -hmm. Maybe Warren or Daniel. Yeah. And I think she was... Her mental state was deteriorating rapidly. Mm-hmm. on this uh, as they were pulled over and she even forgot that Warren was coming to get them uh, and she just proceeded to drive I think she, she she just completely her mental state in those five minutes completely deteriorated to the point where she just left the phone there do you think it was because her mental health was deteriorating or the mental state was deteriorating do you think it was because of that, or do you think it was her independence kicking in? Like, I could get these kids back home safely on my own? That's a good question. I think, I think uh, to me, it seems that alcohol and potentially weed is at play here. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking about. But could those, you know, factors like alcohol and, and weed, could it bring out her nature of like trying to figure everything out on herself and just just kind of booking it and just kind of being on a mission now to get back home i could see that happening Mm -hmm. obviously she shouldn't be doing that because she's unable to drive at that point clearly but she proceeds to drive anyways Mm -hmm. so do you think there's a, a reason why diane left her phone behind or do you think it was just she didn't even realize that she's leaving the phone behind. I think she didn't realize it. I think it was definitely unintentional. What do you think? I mean, if it was intentional, what would that mean? What would Diane leaving the phone intentionally mean? Something you and I don't want to mention or say here. Suicide? That she was going to commit that? Mm-hmm. It seems so. But at the same time, I was thinking maybe it could be one of the kids who left it there. Yeah, it could be because there's a lot of young kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were trying to help out. The oldest one was trying to help out. And out of like panic or like the chaos happening, she just left it there, forgotten about it. At this point, do you think it's more of a, do you get more of a suicidal feel here? Or do you feel, or or do you get more of um, accidental over drinking and uh, just being clumsy like that what what are you gauging right now do you, are are you sensing any like let's say deeper deeper problems here than just alcohol there at this, might at this point yeah there might but i don't think it's suicide because there's too many people, too many kids involved. It's she, too messy. And she, and she seems that she would not want to hurt the kids. Especially her like children. Her own children yeah. that she's been busy raising mm-hmm. for many years now. And yeah, if that was her intention, shouldn't she... I don't know. She probably felt bad for the two-year-old kid because there was a two-year-old baby there. I don't think it's her intention to just drive off to another life. That's true. So, 
Her brother Warren called Deanne's phone again at 1.15 p.m. and it went to voicemail. He called more than a dozen times over the next 20 minutes and all of the calls went to voicemail, obviously, because the call the phone is left behind. Shortly after 1.30 p.m., Deanne made a right turn from Pleasantville Road onto the exit ramp for the Taconic State Parkway. She drove the wrong way. She drove in the south direction on a northbound traffic. So the traffic is going north mm -hmm. in that lane, but she's going south. She's going against the traffic. Um, yeah, for clarification, um, in this part of the story, were they still heading south? Were they still heading down home? Or were, did they did they get redirected somewhere else? That's a very good question that you asked mm -hmm. because at this point, they're already going back south. But for some reason, Diane, prior to going south, mm -hmm. she was heading north for a while. It's unknown why. Maybe she was confused. Yeah. But she was heading north for a while. And she kind of, once again, put herself back on the right track. Mm -hmm. Obviously just in the wrong lane. Yeah. But she was once again heading south. But that's a very good point. Now she was once again heading towards New York City, where she had to go. So she just missed the exit. No, she didn't miss the exit. In fact, I found this particular exit that she took mm -hmm. to go on the highway on YouTube. Oh, so what? <laughs> on Google Street View. This was such a brain freeze. Okay, so on YouTube Street View. Google. <laughs> you oh my God. You said YouTube Maps, YouTube Street View. <laughs> okay, I'm obsessed with YouTube. <laughs> That's my secret. Hey, maybe they developed something we don't know about yet. Yeah. Maybe you're ahead of us. YouTube Maps. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no. So speaking about the Google Street View, right? Mm -hmm. We have these images. This is, I have a screenshot taken where, yeah. and we're showing this on the YouTube channel. So if anyone is curious, you could just quickly peep the YT channel. And uh, you see, there's clear signs. Mm-hmm that this is one way see it says one way on yeah. here and once you take this turn because this is the turn that Diane took it clearly says wrong way wrong way you see because yeah. you're not supposed to be seeing these signs they were there placed there because you are not supposed to be seeing these signs if you're going in the wrong way because the people are that are driving from the correct way they're just seeing a blank sign mm -hmm. they see nothing but from the other side, the sign says wrong way, clearly indicating that you shouldn't go there. And this is literally what you would see immediately if you drive in. This is what you would see, cars coming right at you. Yeah. Which is insane. Um, so she basically took that route and ended up on the wrong side. Yeah, she took, she took this little ramp mm -hmm. road and she ended up on the main highway, just on the wrong, wrong side of the road. And she kept driving for 1.7 miles. Okay, so we know that Diane was traveling for 1.7 miles in the opposite direction, and at 1.35 p.m. she collided with the 2004 Chevrolet Trailblazer, which then struck another vehicle, a 2002 Chevrolet Tracker. At the time of impact, Diane was traveling at approximately 85 miles per hour, so it was a very fast pace and uh, it was a fatal accident but okay for people who don't know much about cars and about driving aka me the the way she was driving the speed was it normal for a highway or is it a little faster i think it's normal for a highway maybe a little fast on the faster side but obviously mm -hmm. when you're heading in the opposite direction then it's pretty bad mm, i see the two men who witnessed the crash uh, and saw immediately that smoke was rising out of the minivan. And they ran to assist the occupants. After removing Diane from the vehicle, the two men saw a large broken absolute vodka bottle by the driver's seat. By the driver's seat? Yeah. Oh, geez, I always assumed that it was at the very back. 
it was by the driver's seat, allegedly. Yes. So when witnesses came out, they told the media and law enforcement that they saw Diane drove that 1.7 mile stretch with her eyes on the road, both hands on the wheel, and almost a calm and peaceful look on her face as she was driving. Do you think the marijuana and the alcohols were taking effect by then? Yeah, I think I think if she was drinking and smoking weed, maybe that could explain why she was so nonchalant about mm-hmm. driving at the... She was so calm about it. Exactly. Do you think that Diane was drinking f- vodka from that broken absolute vodka bottle that was found? Do you and think she was drinking that vodka? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to think, actually, because... I really initially thought it was at the back. So I thought it was like, okay, it just they went on a camping trip. One of the things they, they had to pack. But um, since you told me it was on the driver's seat, I mean, there's like 99% chance she was drinking, no? Yeah, I mean, it makes it's like the most obvious explanation. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, that bottle of vodka initially was in the camper. And Diane potentially took it from the camper to the car. So she made that choice. Mm-hmm. I think it was supposed to be left in the camper. Interesting. So Diane, her daughter, and two of her nieces died immediately at the scene, along with three other men in that trailblazer. 81-year-old Michael Bastardi, 49-year-old Guy Bastardi, Michael's son, and their friend, 74-year-old Dan Longo. The two occupants of the tracker suffered only minor injuries, the third car that was involved in the accident. Mm -hmm. Diane severely injured third niece, her severely injured third niece, and her five-year-old son, Brian, were taken to the hospitals, where the niece died later that day, but Brian was the only passenger of Diane's vehicle to survive. He suffered from broken bones and a severe head trauma. He remained hospitalized for several weeks before returning home in early October. Mm -hmm. So allegedly the children had been in the back seat, but they were not secured in car seats, nor did they appear to have been wearing seat belts. Which I guess is pretty regular, at least here, Mm -hmm. in the back seat of the car. You usually don't wear uh, a belt. Really? Yeah. So, Diane's toxicology report came in and was released on August 4th of that same year by Westchester County Medical Examiners, who found that Diane had a blood alcohol content of 0.19% with approximately 6 grams of alcohol in her stomach that had not yet been absorbed into her blood, meaning that she probably had consumed that 4 grams of alcohol, sorry, 6 grams of alcohol, shortly before the crash, Mm -hmm. which makes me think that maybe she was drinking from that vodka bottle. That's just the conclusion that I'm making here. Yeah, I think so too. The legal blood alcohol content limit for driving while intoxicated in the state of New York is 0.08%. The report also said that Diane had high levels of THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, in her system, Mm -hmm. meaning that she probably also consumed some marijuana leading up to the crash, maybe as she was driving. Mm -hmm. Diane also had high levels of THC, and it was enough to suggest that she could have smoked marijuana as recently as 15 minutes before the crash had happened. Oh, geez. Yeah. So, after she had those calls with family members, Mm -hmm. with her brother Warren, she proceeded to potentially smoke marijuana later on. Diane's husband, Daniel, strongly disagreed with the conclusion that she was heavily intoxicated at the time of the crash. You remember that. Mm -hmm. This was on the documentary. Given that several children had been with him, he initially denied that Diane had taken any illegal drugs or was drinking that weekend at the campground. 
Daniel then proceeded to change his story over time and consistently still denied that his wife ever, never drank to excess during the trip or could have been drunk while driving at the time of the collision. When asked about the vodka bottle discovered in the minivan, he claimed that the couple always kept an old bottle in the camper. He further stated that Diane did all the packing that morning and must have moved the bottle into the van, potentially. I mean, yeah, but that doesn't still explain why it was in the driver's seat, by the driver's seat. Oh yeah, I don't, no, th it doesn't explain that. Mm -hmm. I think there is no, I think there's only one real explanation. Yeah. It's what we're both thinking about. Daniel eventually admitted that he and his wife had consumed alcohol during the camping trip. He denied that Deanne had anything to drink on the day before the crash. So I have to ask you a question. Do you think that Deanne brought marijuana on a family camping trip? Possibly. Because if I remember correctly, in the documentary, it said that she was taking marijuana when she had a hard time sleeping. Right? Yes. So maybe she actually brought marijuana with her in that camping trip just in case she would find it uncomfortable or hard to sleep because it's a different environment, it's not home. Maybe it's going to be easier for her to have a good night's sleep after smoking a pot yeah. or a joint. And since if she was a regular smoker, I think it wouldn't be completely out of the ordinary to bring some to the camping trip. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, the camp owner, who saw the family leave at approximately 9 that morning, was a friend of the family because I think the family had already camped there for a while at that point. Mm -hmm. And that owner, who was a woman, she reported that Diane appeared to be sober as she was leaving. The gas station employee from whom Diane Schuler had attempted to buy over-the-counter painkillers at around 11 p.m. that morning, vigorously denied that she had been drunk, stating, I know for a fact that she was not drunk when she came into the station. Very, like, seems like this person has a lot of conviction mm -hmm. that Diane was sober at the gas station at 11. Yeah. None of the McDonald's employees had seen anything in Diane Schuller's behavior to suggest that she was intoxicated. In fact, she had been observed carrying out an extended conversation with one of the employees as she was ordering her food and orange juice. So I'm thinking if she had to start drinking, she really had to start drinking in my eyes it may have started after that call with Warren, mm -hmm. the first call with Warren where she still seems perfectly normal and she realizes that due to traffic, this is going to be a long trip. And if it's going to be a long trip, maybe I, she decided to make the trip go faster by drinking alcohol. Yeah, but I can't stop thinking about that painkillers she was attempting to buy at the store. Why would you need painkillers? Exactly. The only the only line of thinking, if we're going with this kind of really damning alcoholic mm -hmm. kind of theory, is that maybe she had a massive hangover mm -hmm. from the camping trip. Maybe she was already drinking a lot on the camping trip. But there is no info. So this is just pure speculation. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, then that means she was in pain yeah. on the drive back. Exactly. So do you think um, since she couldn't find any painkillers, do you think she just resorted to alcohol? And, and, probably, and weed. Yeah. To numb the pain, whatever pain she was feeling. Yeah, whatever, at that whatever pain she was feeling. Exactly. But what could have been the pain? Because remember in the documentary, the family attorney claims that she had a problem with her tooth. She had a toothache. She had an abscess. Mm -hmm. Remember? Well, you had toothaches before. I had toothaches before. They are painful. They're painful, but nothing that would make me kind of 
start drinking while I'm driving, for sure, unless it was some, well, I would never do it. I'm not saying that I would ever do it, but maybe what she was feeling was more severe mm-hmm. abscess. Yeah, because I remember in the documentary, one of the one of her friends mentioned that she was already like massaging her jaw like a week prior the accident. Yeah. So maybe it was severe type of pain. It was. It could have been potentially a severe type of pain, but I think it was proven somewhere that they spoke to her dentist and she didn't have an abscess. Hmm wasn't the real thing potentially but i could be wrong on this detail regardless this is the time when i want to discuss the main theories behind what could have happened so the first theory is uh, the one that is proposed on uh, the documentary that we've watched there's something wrong with aunt diane it was directed by liz garbuz for hbo documentaries it was made in 2011 it was, I think, released after a two-year anniversary of uh, the accident. Mm-hmm. In that documentary, it is suggested that Diane Schuler could have been suffering from severe pain caused by a tooth abscess during the drive home, causing her to look for painkillers at the gas station, and upon failing to find any, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, the pain of the abscess combined with vodka and marijuana could have put her in a temporary state of delirium that triggered her fatal behavior. Any thoughts about uh, this theory that was brought during the documentary? Yeah, this one's very convincing, I'm not gonna lie. Because I don't think she was ever a bad mother or a bad aunt. And I don't know, for from the pictures, it seems like she loved the children and she was loved. And I could see no reason why she would have been drinking while transporting those children. Except for the fact that she was in pain, probably. Yeah. Like severe pain, she could have handled it. Fair enough. Another theory suggests a, a, a bit of a different outcome. Another theory suggests that Diane potentially woke up already with a hangover. Mm-hmm. And she was in a miserable marriage that she potentially didn't really enjoy her marriage with Daniel. And there's a lot of speculation because at least the wife that I'm the vibe that I'm getting about Daniel after the documentary that I don't know how close they were. Yeah. Even even in the information I provided earlier, it seemed that they weren't even spending that much time together. Because they were work their work schedules meant that they couldn't really spend a lot of time with each other. So I'm not really sure if their relationship was amazing to begin with. They potentially had a fight or an argument with each other while packing up the campsite to return home. So Diane potentially went to McDonald's in order to get some food in an attempt to relieve the hangover. She also stopped at the gas bar for fuel and asked staff for pain relievers. None were available. And she decided to have a drink to relieve the hangover symptoms. One swig led to another. She then proceeded to consume some weed, uh, which made her nauseous. She pulled over and got sick along the road. She felt bad about the kids in her care. And knowing that she was in a bad state, she did call Warren, her brother. Then she had another swig of vodka, potentially, or something along those lines, and uh, that led to a blackout. Mm -hmm. She left her phone and started driving erratically, leading to the death of the children and herself and the passengers of the oncoming traffic SUV. I am not sure about this one because we don't have much information about the marriage. And... Regarding the hangover, I don't think she would endanger the lives of the children. And she already knows she was hungover. Uh, I don't think um, alcohol would have made it better. Yeah, that's if she was a very responsible woman, which we don't know. Mm -hmm. She may have been, but we don't necessarily know that. Yeah, McDonald's would have made it better for sure, but not alcohol, more alcohol. True. Right. Another line of thinking is that maybe she has been a secret alcoholic. And maybe she thought that she would not get that drunk 
by just drinking a few swigs of vodka with orange juice. It's vodka. But maybe if you're an active alcoholic, maybe you think that you can handle at least a few. But maybe as the trip progressed, she kept drinking and things got out of hand. And by that time, she stopped at the stop where she had that call with her brother, Warren. Maybe at that point, something triggered in her head that she felt, okay, I caused a huge problem right now. Everyone is going to find out that I have been drinking. Warren's going to be here. He's going to find out that, oh, I've been drinking and driving with his daughters. This is going to cause a major problem for me in the future. Mm -hmm. And it triggered some sort of a psychosis moment where she tried dialing something, anyone, for four times, maybe Warren, to tell him that everything's okay, don't come. Yeah. And she couldn't do it, so she got in the car. She had that psychosis moment. She started driving somewhere and ended up killing everybody on board. Well, except for her son, Brian. What do you think about this particular theory that she was afraid that people would find out that she was drinking and that caused a psychosis moment for her that day? Yeah, potentially. And that's also plausible. Okay, the last theory that I have is a bit an off-ball theory, mm -hmm. but it's very compelling when you start thinking about it. There's a chance that Diane could have been an opiate addict going through withdrawals. She oh, was that's pretty weird. Yeah, she was drinking and smoking pot to control her withdrawal symptoms, potentially. As evidenced by the fact that she didn't have a tooth problem. Mm -hmm. That the dentist spoke and she didn't really have a tooth problem. But all of her family members thought that she did have a tooth problem. Because she kept rubbing her jaw in a weird manner. Remember? They mm -hmm. were even talking about this during the documentary. She may have been doctor shopping at the dentists for prescriptions. Tooth aches are easier to fake and get prescriptions for narcotics to treat. That makes sense. If you're gonna get painkillers, mm -hmm. faking a toothache, it's probably easier than faking something else because yeah. how are you gonna, how are they gonna prove that your tooth doesn't hurt? If That's it hurts, true. it hurts, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you need painkillers, it's probably a, bit, a good way to get painkillers that way. So the line of thinking here would be that Potentially, she wanted to quit her addiction mm -hmm. during the camping trip called Turkey, like just completely go off of it, mm -hmm. but was experiencing classic withdrawal symptoms like vomiting and not being able to understand what's happening, getting sick, having a harder time to see. Like these are kind of symptoms of withdrawal. So maybe she was a secret opiate addict who was going through withdrawal that day. Mm -hmm. That sounds a little far-fetched for me. It's far-fetched, but it's... It makes sense, though. It, it makes sense. It's something that is a bit off-ball, but, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't put it past at least investigating yeah. or discussing this line of thinking. So I think regarding Diane Schuller's case, we don't have anything else to add here. I hope everyone enjoyed the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I hope you guys will leave a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Because we want to grow this podcast. And we will catch you on the next episode. If you want to mention anything to our audience members before we leave. Uh, yeah, please let us know what you think. Um, do you think she was a secret alcoholic or do you think she was just i don't know a mom and an aunt trying to desperately trying to relieve uh yeah pain pain some sort of a medical do you think it was a careless driving accident or do you think it was a medical condition condition yeah. situation wait before we go though yes could there be a chance she was having a stroke and she wasn't under a lot of pain again. I think the autopsy revealed that mm -hmm. she was not having a stroke. Anything, right? Yes. Oh, crap. 
So it wasn't a stroke according to the autopsy results. Mm-hmm. It was just alcoholism and m- marijuana. Or medical. Do you think? I don't know. That's what the attorney of the family claims. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is pretty bizarre. Yeah, leave your thoughts, guys, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Take care. See you. Bye.